Good morning, Dr. Deo Hatfield. It is so good to be gathered together with you this morning online. And I hope you are ready to worship our God, to dive into the Word together, and just to enjoy an incredible time of fellowship together as, uh, as Mo comes and shares a bit of great Word with us a little bit later this morning. Uh, I want to just encourage you this morning, just in terms of giving and generosity. For those of you who have not swapped over to electronic giving yet, we'd really encourage you to do so. And just to keep being generous in every way that the Lord is prompting your heart in this season. So let's get ready to worship together and hand over to our worship team who's going to lead us beautifully this morning. Good morning, Dr. Ray Hatfield. It is awesome spending time with you this morning in, in worship. And uh, I want to invite you as we worship God this morning, like we do every week, <laughs> uh, to take a moment. And uh, as we're worshiping, as we're going through these just moments with God, I want you to meditate on these words. And uh, maybe there's something that's uh, been a challenge in your life at the moment. And you're really asking the question of how, how am I trusting God for, for breakthrough, for victory? for Him to come and move mountains in my life. Uh, and this is a song, this is a moment of just declaring God's victory. And I trust that the Spirit come and minister you, to you this morning as we, as we spend time just in God's presence. So I want to invite you to come and join us as we worship. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only
just as though heaven had gone. person this morning would afresh just realize the absolute victory that we have in you, the absolute victory we sit with. Every single chain, every single challenge, every single mountain. Father, you have given us victory. So let's respond this morning as we just praise you with everything. The next song that we're going to we're going to worship declares this that with every single thing we respond in worship with everything that we have Father we worship Present my life as a living. 
living sacrifice in view of your great mercy in light of all you've done I will love you God with all my strength and heart Lord this is my
Good morning, Dr. Aya Hatfield. It is great sharing word with you this morning. And you can open up your Bible to Psalm 32. But before we get there, I want to tell you a quick story. So when I was about 14 years old, some friends and I decided that we were going to go to Gold Reef City, the famous amusement park. So obviously like teen boys seeking out the biggest thrill and the most adrenaline, we headed down there and uh, we went through all the rides. Okay, we did the Golden Loop, Miner's Revenge, we did the Anaconda, everything was great. And we saved the biggest and baddest and scariest ride for last, the Tower of Terror. Now, if you've ever been, you would know. <laughs> so as we were standing in the queue, I see this structure almost reaching to the heavens and I start feeling a little bit scared. And as group and group before us start going on the solar coaster and I see how people are literally screaming for life and death, I then told myself, I need to get an excuse to not go on the solar coaster today. So I tried everything in front of my friends. I was nauseous, my head was sore, uh, my back was sore, my neck hurt. And they were all just like, dude, we're going on this ride, let's go. So we got in front of the queue and uh, we were the last group, no one behind us. And we all got into this thing. And as we were sitting there, the staff started picking up sandbags and loading it into the empty chairs. And I'm sitting there thinking, why? <laughs> and I asked them, guys, what's this? And they said, no, the, the, the roller coaster will not be balanced unless every seat is full. And I realized that I'm not going to bank my life on a sand sack. So I'm getting out of there. So I jumped off of that roller coaster, all my friends sitting there strapped in. And I tell them, guys, I'm sorry. I am not getting on this ride today. And I turned my back on it and I walked away. My friends then obviously still went on the ride. Afterwards, when I saw them, and more importantly, when I saw them being safe <laughs> and alive, I felt like, oh, you know what, let's just do it. And they wanted to go again. So I got in it and I did go on the Tower of Terror. It is horrific. It is terrifying. 34 meters high up, coming down at 100 kilometers an hour with a G-force rating of 6.3. It is scary. Now to sum up my actions that day in one word, I would use the word repentance. Because you see, the word repentance actually means to turn your back on something and turn towards something else. The word used in the Old Testament uh, for repentance was twofold. The first word, I'm going to try, try and pronounce this, but it, it is the word nacham. Uh, and it means to literally turn around and to change your mind. A second word that was used for repentance was the word sub. And that also means to change your mind. 600 times the Old Testament refers to this action of turning your back on something. Now in the New Testament, we find the word metanoia, which also means the same, to change your mind. And so today, we're going to dive into Psalm 32 because I believe that this has so much to offer us and to teach us regarding repentance. And at the end of the day, ultimately, that repentance is God showing us love and we finding joy and a blessing in Him. You see, God offers us the opportunity to repent, to come into a closer relationship with Him. So let us dive in today as we read Psalm 32. I'm in the CSB, verse 1. It says the following. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle and my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in a summer's heat. And then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not conceal my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Verse 6, therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you immediately with great flood waters. When they come, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. 
ye surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. Verse 8, I will instruct you and show you the way to go. With my eye on you, I will give you counsel. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding that must be controlled with bit and with bridle, or else it will not come near you. Many pains come to the wicked, but the one who trusts in the Lord will have faithful love surrounding him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, your righteous ones. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So let's break down Psalm 32 this morning as we find within it what it is trying to teach us regarding repentance. Now the first five verses, verse 1 to 5, were grouped together and within these five verses we find two themes. The first one is God's forgiveness and the second is our confession. Now if we dive into this, David firstly makes two points when he says in number uh, in verse 1 and verse 2, we see that we are forgiven by God and that leaves us being blessed and joyful. That's the first point that David makes, verse 1 and 2. But then in verses 3, 4 and 5, he teaches us what not to do and what to do to experience fully this joyful and blessing of being forgiven by God. He says, when I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. Firstly, what not to do. But then secondly, he tells us in verse 5 what we should do and what he did. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not conceal my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. These five verses uh, gets captured so well by this typical Christian cliche, and I know it is a cliche, but it does capture it so well. And it's this quote that says, religion says, I messed up, my father is going to kill me. But the gospel says, I messed up, I need to call my dad. You see, that's the big difference is, number one, for us to, to realize and to know by head and by heart that God does not demand repentance from us, but rather He desires something in repentance for us. The joyfulness and the absolute blessing that it is to turn to our Father, to turn to our Dad, to change our mind and change our back and turn our back towards or from something towards Him. Romans 5 or 6 to 8 says this so well when Paul writes and he says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely someone will die for a just person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more having been reconciled will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. So that is the first five verses of the psalm. It's the, it's the story of us turning to a father and, and a father embracing us and the joy that we find in doing so. The absolute blessing, the first blessing that it is fully forgiven. Whatever we turn to God with is fully forgiven. But the second blessing I believe that, that David so clearly writes about here is that it is joyful to turn to our father. We don't come begging on our knees, beaten down, slowly approaching God. No, we run to our dad. The next two verses in Psalm 32 that is grouped together, together is uh, verse 6 and 7. And these two verses build on what we just read in verses 1 to 5. So if we realize this foundation of reconciliation is us coming to God, admitting 
turning towards him and him forgiving us, if we know that that is the foundation, something else happens upon that foundation. This is the table that has been set before us. So not only does God forgive our sin and embraces us, he does something else as well. Let's quickly read verse six and seven. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you immediately. When great floodwaters come, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. God does not only deal with our guilt, but he also addresses our shame. See, what David is writing here is that for us running into the, the arms of the Father as we, as we repent towards Him, we find something in those arms. It's not just forgiveness. It's something that God proclaims over us. Not only does He address the guilt, but He addresses the shame that so often follows us when we do fall and stumble. And God makes a point of it when He says that I am your protector. I am your hiding place and I surround you, such a beautiful and vivid picture, God surrounding us, constantly shouting with joy, deliverance, freedom, you are free. It's so beautiful to actually see that, that God becomes our hiding place. He becomes our affirmation. See, the effects of sin sometimes hits the hardest. <laughs> not feeling good enough, not feeling strong enough, feeling like a failure. And you see, this is where God not only wants to address our behavior, but address our heart and pick us up like a dad would pick up a child that literally just fell down and scraped themselves on the concrete and embrace them. We will treat the wound, but I want to embrace you. I think this is something that David so, so vividly experienced as God, I was stubborn. I tried to hide myself from you and I felt heavy and burdened. But as soon as I turned my back on that and turned my face towards you, I found something so much more than just forgiveness. I found your affirmation. I found your protection. I found your friendship. Now, the next story that I'm going to tell you uh, is, is not exactly the best example of this, um, but I'm, I'm not a parent and this is the closest that I've ever become to being a parent. So my wife and I, We've got a golden retriever who's four years old. And when we got to Baka, only at seven weeks, we had to potty train him or house train him. Now, for anyone who's ever had to train a puppy, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is hard work. It is dedication and patience. And the first thing that you need to know is that a puppy, unfortunately, does not have bladder control up to three months. So they cannot control when they have to go. So when they do mess up and do make a mistake, you have to clean it up and take it away, not make a scene about it. You see, the important thing about training a puppy is if you do take him outside and he does his business on the lawn or whatever, you champion that dog for a good two minutes. You are the best dog. You are the greatest dog. You are the strongest dog in the moot. I love you. You are my Chewbacca. You champion that dog. And what happens is every single time that dog gets affirmed, it is not reinforcing a behavior, it is reinforcing his identity. Now, I know I might be taking this a little bit too far <laughs> because he is still a dog, but I can promise you this, since we've gotten to Baka, the four years that we've had him, he has never once had a mistake in the house. <laughs> uh, there's been opportunities once or twice where he had a, a, a tummy bug and unfortunately we just couldn't help it. But if it's from his own decision, that dog chooses to do what he does, rooted in his identity and his character. You see, Chewbacca never learned what to do and what not to do based on fear or fear of punishment. He learned what to do and what not to do based in his confidence, not just in me as his owner and his trust in me, but he learned what he should do in his confidence based in who he was. You see, that dog somewhere, the penny dropped for him. That for me to live in this house with these people and these humans, when I do certain things, I want to do it from a place of confidence and trust in myself as well as in my owner. 
See, that's the second point. Similarly, God does the same with us. He forgives us, but he also protects and affirms us. When he takes us in and says, I'm going to deal with your guilt, but I'll also deal with the shame and I'll come and reestablish your identity. I will show you who you are and I will let you live in that blessing, in that joy, in that confidence close to me freely as God declares that we are his and free. Let's pick up verse 8 and 9 in Psalm 32. Something shifts in these two verses. Up until now, this has been David writing from himself. But it's as if in these two verses, David put down the pen and God stepped in and took that pen and started writing the following words. It says in verse 8, I will instruct you and show you the way to go with my eye on you. I will give you counsel. Verse 9, do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding that must be controlled with a bit and with bridle, or else it wouldn't come to you. John Piper writes the following, he says, God is in the business of not just covering our sins, but also shaping our character. And a mule really is just such a stupid and stubborn animal. No offense. <laughs> they are extremely cute, they smell, but they are so stubborn. Although you cannot train a mule, or call it by name and it responds, or let it go freely. They can't fend for themselves. They are highly and heavily dependent on an owner or someone to take care of them, a farmer. You see, the thing about a mule is even day by day as it sees what is being done for it, as it sees how it's being fed and how it's being cleaned and how it has a place to stay and sleep in a barn, it never quite becomes self-aware or even owner aware. If you would have to let a mule go free, it will surely not survive in the wild. You see, this is what God says. If he says that I don't want you to simply do things because I tell you to do it. I want you to understand why certain things are important for you to do. See, God wants to lead us. He wants to shape us. He wants to pick us up from our guilt and he wants to address the shame but he also wants to guide us to avoid future pain. You see, if we do scrape our knee as we fall down on the concrete, there's a lesson to be learned. You see, there's something in the, the nature of God, the, the Father heart, to pick us up, but then also lead us and direct us. See, that is exactly what we see when God says those words, when he says that I will Keep my eye on you. I will show you the way to go. I will give you counsel. These are promises from God. In verse three, once again, when David writes and he describes how he was silent and his bones became brittle and how he was groaning all day long, we find that David was the mule, <laughs> saying that God, this is what I did. And how, what a burden that was, how, how heavy I felt by trying to be stubborn, not wanting to admit my shortcomings and my shortfalls and my sin and my guilt, how stubborn I was. See, God wants us to not only seek his forgiveness and find it, and not only be addressed in our shame and be reestablished in our identity and him affirming us, but God also wants to come alongside us and be our counsel in close proximity. I think this is the full circle of repentance. If the idea of repentance was just to ask for forgiveness and to have it, I think we would have missed the point. I think the greater reflection that we are doing in this time is to turn to God and say, God, if there are things in my life that I have missed or messed up, I want to turn to you not just to recover from that, but to grow even deeper into you and find the guidance and the leadership and you coming alongside me for the seasons ahead. The last two verses of this psalm sums it up so, so beautifully. It reads, it says, many pains come to the wicked, but the one who trusts in the Lord will have faithful love surrounding him. This is a command, be glad in the Lord and rejoice you righteous ones, 
Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And this is what we see, this shouting for joy and being upright in heart. We see this picture of God's proximity to us and our immediate reaction to grab a hold of Him and grab a hold of His promises. How that cycle leads us and builds us up to become even stronger in Him. To build a relationship with God that is even stronger. It seems so counterintuitive that we have to come to a God with our disappointments and our doubts and our messes and to think that from that God will love us even more. We've got this idea in our mind that if we approach someone with disappointing news and, and having to break their heart, they would turn away from us and say, that is exactly why I don't want to be with you. That is exactly why I don't want to spend time with you. That is exactly why I don't want to be close to you. But you see, God doesn't do that. Never once did he shy away when David approached him. Never once did he turn his back on him, but embraced him. It is only by God's grace that our guilt and sin is dealt with. But it is in that where we find his affirmation and his declaration over us as he embraces us. And from that, from that like any good father, he teaches and leads us for every single step forward. So this morning, I want to encourage you, if we reflect back over 2020 and looking forward to 2021, thinking of this word repentance, knowing that the foundation of this is to approach God honestly and earnestly and allowing God to embrace us and reestablish who we truly are in Him. And then from that, allowing God to guide and lead us. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning we glorify you. We glorify a God whose love is everlasting. And we shout joyfully, rejoicing, that we know within our, our dad's arms we find not only forgiveness, not only the solutions to our messes, but we find a loving God ready to establish our identity, ready to come alongside us, ready to build us up, Jesus, we thank you for that. Father, thank you that you do lead us. Holy Spirit, we, we thank you this morning for, for coming into our lives so gently, but then also helping us every single step of the way so firmly, so clearly, undoubtedly showing us the way to go. Jesus, we pray this morning that the, that the times where we were stubborn, the times that we were mules, and try to hide from you and not wanting to admit our wrongs. Holy Spirit, that there is grace for that, that there is mercy for that. But Father, I pray this morning that you would come and, come and show us those things and come and invite us to approach you. When David writes and he says, you, you who are faithful, turn to God and pray immediately. I want to pray for that this morning, that we would turn to you immediately. A father that is always open-handed, open-armed, waiting for us, ready to embrace us. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. What an incredible word this morning. Uh, we felt it on our hearts as we were just preparing for this morning's message that it would be good for us to just to gather together as church and pray over our country, pray over the realities of lockdown and COVID, and just pray for the people in our lives who've been affected and touched by this pandemic. So let's just pray together this morning. Lord, we just come before you and we thank you, God, that you are a good and faithful God in seasons such as this. And we want to pray for each and every family, each and every person that's been affected by COVID-19 and by this lockdown period. We ask God for healing for those that are currently suffering through um, COVID. We ask, Lord, for just your strength and your comfort for those families that have been severely affected, that have lost loved ones, that have loved ones in hospital at the moment. And God, for so many people, the reality, especially with the rising numbers in our country, um, has been that for many people, this 
pandemic, this disease that is so far away has come rather close and we've got loved ones in our close spheres that currently are being affected um, and that have been infected by COVID-19. So would you come, Lord, would you come into each of those spaces? Would you come into just the places in our hearts where fear has maybe started to reign? or where despair has taken root and come and Lord, would you come and bring your hope? Would you come and just restore hope for our loved ones, hope for our country? And Lord, we pray especially over our economy. We pray for wisdom for our leaders. We pray Lord that in every way that our country needs it most right now, that you would come in like a flood and you would bring wisdom and peace and that you would stomp out fear, God, and fear-based responses. But that we as believers, God, would keep praying, that we would keep lifting up those that need it in this time. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, God, that you are in this pandemic with us. Thank you, Lord, that you are walking us through it and out the other side. And thank you, God, that we can faithfully say that our God is good. He is for us and He is working in the midst of our trial. We love you, God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. We just wanna thank you for joining with us this morning. And we pray that you've had such a blessed time in the Word and in worship. And we'd encourage you to share this morning's service with anyone you know that might need a word of hope um, and just an incredible word in this season. Bless you and have a great Sunday.